Good morning, superhumans! Uh, I don't have Ian Coldwater's awesome hair, unfortunately, so I have to settle for this. It's uh, the nearest I could get. Oh well, it'll have to do. It keeps my head warm anyway. So, um, first up, my, uh, my Aboriginal awareness shout-out today is to the Blackademia podcast by Amy Tunig. I've been listening to this recently, and I found it uh, very interesting to listen to her perspective on... Uh, on the on the experiences of First Nations people in academia. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, go and check this out. So I have I personally actually have very little interest in in the academic life, but hearing about other people's experiences and perspectives is always interesting. So check that out. Now, um, today I had a couple of ideas about things I want to talk about, and uh, Roger Tenfor at the start of the chat said, hopefully going to hear more about the launch of the new light switches and maybe launch date this year. So that is what I'm going to start with. It's, uh, it's not what I was going to start with originally, but <laughs> Roger has set the, uh, the topic to start with. Oh no, I've just locked my computer accidentally. I have no idea if the stream is still going. Hopefully it is. Uh -huh, I'm back. I logged in again. Okay. So where are we? Let's um, let's head here for a second. So this is the current version of the smart switch, light switch. This is the controller. It's actually two PCBs that are sandwiched together. And in fact, let's switch over to this view. And I'll show you the previous thing. I've shown this in the past, but I'll just give you the 30 second recap. So the idea with this is that this PCB that is in the back is the controller. On this one, there's an ESP8266. So it's got an ESP12E module in there. And there's an RJ45 socket, like an 8P8C socket, voltage regulator, a couple of other things. And that sits sandwiched onto the top of another board, which is where the buttons connect. And that way you can use the same controller with multiple button panels. So in this particular case, it's a button panel for four buttons, but it could also be three, two, one, whatever. Uh, it, at the moment it's capped in four, just capped to a limit of four, just because of the way the architecture is set up. But uh, yeah, there's some flexibility there. And you can see this one's got some patches on it. I've talked about this on a previous live stream, so I'm not going to go into that in too much more detail. Because where we went from there, in fact, what's the date on this? This one is 2018. I think it was beginning of 2018 I was working on that. And in fact, late 2017 I did the previous version of that. And it's all just been waiting for me to get around to finishing it. So, uh, where this has gone since is this. In fact, while we're here, maybe I'll hit the soldering iron and add some connectors onto this because I still haven't even uh, soldered a couple of parts onto this. I've just been doing some testing. So this is the previous version that you can see here. And as you can see, I've got the ESP12 module under the PCB on this one, connector on this side. And then I located the parts down the sides of the PCB. So I kept this area of the PCB clear so that if I plugged in a cable, it's not going to obstruct anything. In fact, I'll grab a, a little patch lead. So what I have here is a little RJ45 patch lead with a PoE injector attached to it. And so what you can see is the idea is that this plugs in like that. So that would be inside the wall providing the connection back to the light switch controller and providing power to this. And in fact, let's um, take this a little bit further. Turn on, I'll turn on one of my, my power supplies. What do I need? I need a connection to a, uh, yeah, 2.1 mil DC jack. So I'm gonna grab one of these cables, stick this in and I'll give it what, about 12 volts or so. It's got a little switch mode power supply in the front of it. Well, it's set to 13 volts, that's close enough. So what I'm doing now is I've got the smart switch, 
going to a bit of cable with a PoE injector and I'm going to plug my power supply into the injector so the power goes down the cable to this and hang on I'll turn it on let's see if any smoke comes out it's set to an optimistic 6 amp current limit well as you can see on it's actually not that visible in the camera it looks like they're glowing sort of white but at the moment these LEDs are glowing blue and if I press them it flashes that's just because it's reading oh so that's I pressed it once and it's turned off press it again and it's turned on so at the moment I've got Tasmoda oh yeah it is it's got Tasmoda running on this and it's only set up for a single button event so if you press like it's not distinguishing between the buttons and the output is controlling all of them so press it once turns on press it again it turns off it's not distinguishing and driving the four channels individually but anyway I kind of put that aside because I was moving on to the new design the new and improved version so I'll pull that out of there I'll stick that aside for now and this is the updated version so this is the control board and this is the updated button panel like panel board and the idea is that this will have a, uh, a socket on here so that it goes onto this those two will be sandwiched together and I could do it just by mounting this on the top and soldering it directly which means it would be a very low profile but you'd never get those boards apart again not without a whole lot of work anyway so for the test version I'm just going to put a socket on this even though that will make the profile quite high it'll bring it out to about here you can see that one of the differences is that I switched to 0.1 millimeter uh, pin headers on here and on here it's got I think this is two millimeter pitch pin headers so it's a fairly low profile gap between those two boards it's going to be a bit more of a gap between these boards and I put on some funky artwork there to show where the cable is going to be when it's plugged in so what I should do is grab a couple of connectors and solder them on as you can see I've partly assembled this one. Oh yeah and the other change it's got these buttons on the top so I've got the reset button and the snoot button on the top but all of the other parts are on the bottom now unlike this one where I put the ESP module on the bottom and then I put all of the other parts like the um, the transistors for the interfaces to the buttons uh, on the top with this one all of the surface mount parts with the exception of these buttons are on the bottom so everything is on the same side which is a bit nicer from an assembly point of view and it also means that there's just a whole lot more space instead of having to jam all of the parts down these little gaps down here I've got the whole area of the board to work with now uh, oh yeah so where this is at is right now this particular board has Tasmoda loaded onto it and I, um, I put an ESP flash header on it so this is the header format that I've been using for a while now the first four pins so ground TX RX and 3.3 volts if you ignore those top two pins so those bottom let's bring this up a bit closer if it'll focus don't think it will those bottom four pins are exactly the same as the header on a Sonoff and then all I've done is added the extra two pins so reset and GPIO zero off on the end there to allow auto reset and bootloader mode and then where is it somewhere around here so then I've got my ESP flasher so to load code onto this I can just plug this in it's got USB-C and then we can load new firmware onto it so uh, yeah so as I was saying this one right now has Tasmota loaded on it and it's functional so it connects to my NQTT broker I've um, I've just been testing this by uh, yeah by playing with it directly I haven't got as far as assembling a whole thing and connecting this up so oh yeah this is a bit I haven't really shown you properly yet this is the board that goes in the back of the light switch 
So we've got these RGB buttons that mount through a regular Clipsal wall plate and then they solder into the carrier board. Now this carrier board is a three button carrier board. You can see this one that's on here is a four button and I've also got a two button version. And if you wanted to make a single button light switch, you could use a three button carrier and only populate the center position. So that gives you the option of doing one, two, three, or four. Now, I wouldn't use the three button carrier to make a two way switch because the gap between these is too big. It would look a bit silly if there was one button right up here and one button right down here with a big gap in the middle. The aesthetics just don't work out. But I've got, um, in fact, somewhere around here. Where did I put it? Right before I started this live stream, I grabbed out a plastic container. How, you've seen me do this before. I have something right here and then I want to show it to you and I can't find it. And that's because I put it back in its storage location. It's kind of almost like I'm trying to be organized, but my organization is outsmarting myself. So, let's see what we've got. These are the PCBs for the controller. These are the PCBs for the three-way, which we've seen just here. Then I've got, I haven't even opened these packets yet. These are the PCBs for the two-way switch, PCBs for the four-way switch. With the, uh, these versions all have the 0.1 inch pitch interconnect between the, the two boards that are in the sandwich. So where it stands right now is the circuit on this has not changed and I verified, I know that this circuit works because that's what's in this. It's basically the same thing. All I did really was change the pitch of the interconnect between the boards, the board to board interconnect. So I'm pretty confident that this circuit is good. And this one has been fairly majorly redesigned, but it's more a mechanical redesign than a schematic. The schematic hasn't really changed that much. Very, very minor change. So in terms, from an electrical point of view, I'm pretty confident that this is good. And this is running Tasmoda. So now I need to do the config. So while I'm talking about this, what am I going to put in? Uh, let's see. I need to stick on. So I need to put on a 5.5 volt regulator. I need to put on an 8P8C socket. What have I got here? K7805. I really like these little regulators. The K series are like the L78 series, except that they are switch mode. Now I need, where can I find? Oh look, here are 500 I prepared earlier. Some, 8P8C sockets and I need a 5mm, I think it's 5mm screw terminal, might be a 3.5mm pitch. I can't remember what I used on this one. Is it 5? Yes it is. Oh yes, and as I was doing this I got some feedback and because I asked for some hmm, footprint works better this way but doesn't matter. Yeah, so on this layout, on my original layout, this one here, you can see that I've got the screw terminals coming in sideways. So if you're supplying power directly on the board and not using power over the network connection, well, it's not a network connection, but over the AP8C cable, you can just supply power directly in here. And the cable comes in from the side. And uh, I can't remember who, but someone had a look at this design just before I sent it off for fabrication and suggested that I rotate this connector. So I've changed from a 3.5 millimeter pitch screw terminal to a five millimeter pitch. And one of the reasons for that is that these 3.5 millimeter pitch terminals use fairly small screws. And I just find it really annoying trying to get a screwdriver into it. So what I end up having to do is use a screwdriver. In fact, I wonder if this one will fit. No, even this one doesn't fit. So this is a screwdriver with a fairly narrow blade. 
So I end up having to go to ridiculous things like this. This is a little screwdriver that I got from my friend John uh, a couple of years ago. It's not quite a jeweler screwdriver. I mean, a jeweler screwdriver would work fine, but this little screwdriver is good for 3.5 millimeter terminals. But it's just annoying when you can't use a regular sort of uh, uh, straight blade screwdriver. That's annoying. So I've ended up switching over to the five millimeter terminals just because you can use you can use a jeweler screwdriver or you can just grab a something like this and it fits. And that includes things like the insulated screwdrivers commonly used by electricians. So uh, yeah, anyway, time to do some soldering. I think my soldering iron should be hot now. I need a little bit of water on the sponge. My, the soldering iron tip <clears throat> is in pretty bad shape at the moment, the one that's on my main iron. I need to, uh, I ordered some new ones. Well, it's not too bad. You can see it there. This is the K type tip, which is like an angled uh, wedge, which is my favorite tip style. And uh, I've ordered some more, but they haven't arrived yet. So in the meantime, I just have to make do with this. Yep. So I'm basically just going to make you watch while I assemble something, which is not the most exciting thing in the world, but it gets us one step closer. <laughs> I think the way to keep myself accountable is to work on things and like these light switches for example I've got so many projects that I'm working on these light switches have kind of slipped off my radar again just in the last few days like in the last couple of weeks so I've had these boards now for weeks and haven't progressed past getting Tasmoda running on this because I just keep getting switched off onto other things now where did my cutters go? I don't even know where my side cutters are Oh well, let's not worry about that for now. And what have we got here? Is it the 7805? Yes, it is. So I'll put the voltage regulator on here. And yeah, if the problem is that people on live stream say, hey, when are the light switches coming out? Or when is the new lighting controller coming out? Or whatever. And I talk about it and I promise to do something about it. And then. I go off and do other things and then I don't even think about it until someone asks again on another live stream. So this time since, uh, who was it? Oh, it scrolled off the screen now. Um, someone, Magic Blue Smoke was it? Someone said what's happened with this and the way to get myself making progress on it is to do it right now on the spot. And then I might get somewhere. So, come on. Oh yeah, so that's right. I was just saying the, um, the soldering iron tips. <clears throat> um, that's something that I'm curious to know. And soldering is one of the topics that I was wanting to bring up today. That is something that I will get into a little bit later in the live stream. But in the meantime, I'm curious to know about people's preferred soldering iron tips. Because one thing that I've seen is that a lot of people who don't do much soldering or are beginners at, at surface mount in particular, think that the smaller the tip that you use, the better. And that's not necessarily the case. So a lot of people go for Things like really sharp needle points. Let me pull out an example. So here's a set of tips of different sizes. These are all to suit my uh, my this Hako iron. Okay, here's a good example. This is a tip that is like a it just goes to a very sharp point and it's got a very narrow shaft on it. 
and let's uh, let's switch over here. See if we can see it. So you can see the shape of it there. Zoom out and get some focus. Focus, come on. Focus. Okay, so yeah, you know, a lot of people when they're starting with surface mount soldering, they will just grab a tip like this and work on the they work on the principle that the smaller the tip is, the more precise you can be in terms of its positioning and the better that's going to be. But that doesn't actually work that well. Um, just for comparison, where is it? Okay, so here is, uh, now this is an older one, but this is my preferred tip. So this one is a K style tip. And I'll put that next to this one. So a lot of people when they begin surface mount soldering, they go for a needle type tip like this. And you'll find that people that have a lot of experience with surface mount soldering typically go for something like a K-style tip, like this one that's up the top. Or other um, popular ones are, uh, I can't remember the, the actual letter code for this, but this one which is cylindrical, but it's got a, like a cross-cut face on it, so it's got an oval shape on the end. This one is also very popular with people that do a lot of soldering. And you can get these with, in fact, I think this one might have a little well in the end of it. So it's not just cross cut, but it's slightly hollowed out. And then that well acts as a reservoir for solder. So the, that sort of style is great for drag soldering. If you are, oh, and here's another one that is the same. So this is another one that I've used in the past, which is why it's got solder on it. So the, this type here is very popular among professionals for drag soldering, which is where you solder pins all down the side of an IC all in one go. And another popular style among the pros is this one here, which is a wedge. You can see that it's, um, it's conical shaped but it's got a chamfer off two sides of it. So you end up with a straight end and then uh, cuts off the side. So the, um, sorry, I'm just <laughs> context switching here. Back to the smart switch. No, I'll get back to the smart switch a little bit later. Let's, uh, let's talk about soldering iron tips for a moment, a moment longer. Now, the reason that, uh, I need to find something to point with. Where is a pointer? Okay, this will do as a pointer. A little tool I've had. I've had this tool for, must be about 35 years. Uh, so this is like a scribing tool for, um, commonly used in uh, screen printing, I think, and other things like that. It's an artistic art tool. So let's get these out of the way. And let's talk about the soldering iron tip for a moment. Now, why is this bad for surface mount soldering? And also I should point out that there are some situations where this tip is fantastic and it's exactly what you want, but it's not, um, what I'm trying to convey here is that the general principle is not that you should go for the smallest tip that you possibly can and therefore you're the most accurate. It doesn't work that way. Now, one of the, the things is, one of the characteristics of solder is that it tends to flow towards heat. So if you have, um, say you've got, when you're doing a solder joint, there are four different aspects to it. There are four different uh, items that you are trying to move physically into the correct location. There is the pad that you're soldering to, the pin or the contact that you're trying to solder, the tip of the soldering iron and the solder. So those four things. And then of course there is heat and timing and all of those things. But I'm talking about the four physical things that need to relate to each other. And as you're soldering the joint, all four of those things end up at the same temperature in order to get the solder to flow. So you need to heat up the pad, you need to heat up the 
pin or the, the contact, you need to heat up the solder and the soldering iron is obviously hot. But the thing is that solder tends to wick in the direction of heat. So what happens is that if, imagine this is the PCB just here, in fact I'll scratch this up a little bit. So say there is the, there is a pad here. I'm messing my, um, messing up my sacrificial mat here. Give it a bit of a scratch. And you apply, you put the soldering iron tip down here on the pad. What happens is that the pad will start to heat up from the point of contact, obviously. Now, one obvious thing to look at here is the point of contact is tiny if you're using a needle tip like this. So the thermal transfer from the iron to the pad and the pin and whatever else is going to be uh, minimal because the, the point where the, temp the heat has to transfer through is this little point of contact. And that means that it's going to take longer for the pad to get hot. It just won't have the same transfer. Now, if you have this tip and you put it down at an angle, say about a 45 degree angle, and if you look at the shape of this, you can see it's got a, um, a cut across the edge here. So there's a large flat area. Imagine you put this down at a 45 degree angle across the pad like this. You've got a big contact area all the way along there and you will very rapidly heat up the target instead of heating it up slowly like you would with this. And the, one of the advantages of that is that if you now apply the solder, so I'll grab a little scrap of solder that's just here. So say you have put your soldering iron here and you put it onto the pad. You've started heating up the pad and then you introduce your solder. What will happen is that because the pad hasn't heated up properly, the solder will tend to wick towards the iron and it will get sucked up here and it will end up coming up the iron tip and then you end up with a glob of solder on your soldering iron, not on the joint. And then you take your iron away and you've got this glob of solder and you can't figure out why, why can't I get the solder to stick to the joint? It's because the solder is heading towards the source of the heat and it's going up onto the soldering iron tip. Whereas if you heat the joint up properly and you get it nice and hot with a big contact area, the solder will flow more evenly and it will wet the, the pad and cover that whole area. So one of the keys is to get as much contact area as you can into the joint to get the heat into it. Which brings me to the next point, which is the position of the thermal mass. Now, if you've got, now I'm going to just totally make up some numbers here <clears throat> because I haven't actually measured this. I don't know what this is, but see from this part of the, the soldering iron tip just there. So this is the main shaft where it goes into the soldering iron and then it's retained by the clip that comes over this little, little ridge there. Now this, so we're just looking at the part of the tip from here up from there to there. Now, just, a, just as a guess, let's say that there is, uh, I don't know, th um, say two grams of metal in that area there. And that two grams has been heated up by the soldering iron and that is what is containing all the thermal energy that you want to transfer into the joint. And as I roll it, you can see that because it's a needle type tip, it's quite small. So let's just take a punt and say there's two grams of metal in there. Now compare that to this from the same location from there to there. Look at the difference in size. So in profile this way, it is probably similar. But in profile this way, there is so much more metal in here, which means the mass of metal in here. So if this is two grams, this is probably more like seven or eight grams or something. It's gonna be a, a few times the mass of this one just because it's so much bigger physically. Now, when you make contact with the joint, there is more energy stored in this tip than in this one. And of course, I'm discounting everything behind this point. And that does come into play as well. 
But think about it from a thermal conduction point of view. Imagine if all of your energy was stored back in the barrel here, in the body, and you want to transfer it to the joint. On the needle tip, all of that energy has to pass down this narrow little gap here. It's a, a small conductor, essentially. It's a small thermal conductor. So when you touch the end of the tip onto the joint, the temperature here drops dramatically because all of the energy is sucked out into the joint and then heat has to flow <clears throat> along this needle to get to here to replenish it. Whereas with this one, heat has this big metal mass to flow through. So whatever energy you have stored up in the iron here gets transferred through to the contact point much, much more effectively. So with these two tips, if you touch this point onto a joint, uh, it'll heat up quite slowly. And if you touch this point onto a joint, it will heat up very quickly and very effectively. So the result is that with this sort of tip, you, you end up with less of that wicking effect where you end up with the ball of solder attached to your soldering iron and you just can't get it onto the joint and it's really frustrating. So, um, and the other advantage of this type of tip is that it is so flexible. So this is one of the reasons that I prefer the K-type tips. I know a lot of pros, so I'm an amateur at this. I just kind of figure out stuff as I go along. I know a lot of pros prefer either this rounded bevel tip or like a, a wedge tip like this. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons that I like the K style tip, which is this one, is that by just rotating your hand and using the iron at a different angle, you've effectively got multiple tip types. So if I want to get into a tiny little point like I would with this one, all I do is rotate the iron and use that tip. So this point here is what I use if I want a very small contact point. So like this iron, if I'm trying to get into the end of like an 0603 or 0402 resistor or something, this is easy to get in and touch just that one location. But with this tip, you can do the same thing. All you do is rotate it, make contact with that sharp point, and now you've got yourself a tiny point that you can use for accurate work. But you still have the advantage that you've got this big thermal mass right behind it. So even if you're not using this face, like that edge of the tip, even if you're just using this point, the difference between getting energy from the body here up to this tip versus getting the body from the body here to that tip, you can see how, uh, how much better the conductivity would be on the K-type tip on the right. So the energy is going to not be impeded by having to travel along this long needle. <coughs> Excuse me. I know, I'm probably going on way too long about this. And I bet everybody in the chat is shouting at me to shut up and do something interesting. So uh, I'm going to stop talking about this. But uh, yeah, my point basically is that with the tip on the left, it's a single purpose tip. All you can do is use a very small contact area. With the tip on the right, it's a multi-purpose tip. I can touch it onto the flat long edge and get a really big contact area for doing large connectors and things. I can rotate it and now I've got myself a point that I can use for things like um, very small parts. This edge I can use for drag soldering. So if I'm going along the edge of an IC, let's just find an example. Okay, so normally you'd use it with you know, 20 pin or whatever ICs, but this is an eight pin IC. So with drag soldering, what I can do is just drag it along here and solder all four of those pins in one go. And it's just, generally more universal. <clears throat> so this tip I can use for lots and lots of different things. And you can see by the discoloration that I have used this tip. And these are useful in situations like where you're trying to do things like a whole bunch of bodge wires into a small part. Uh, where's an example? I'm just trying to find something that I can point out, but oh, okay. This is a totally contrived example, but let's see how we go with this. Now imagine that we had this 
board and all of the connections on these uh, on these were wrong on these little transistors and we had to solder patch wires onto each of these points now with this tip you could do the first one easily enough because you just rotate it and you come in with the, the tip only but then you can see the width of the body gets in the way if I wanted to do more uh, patch wires onto other adjacent pins it's more difficult with this k-type joint or k-type tip whereas with this one I can come in and it's a very narrow profile so I can then get access to these connections and I can solder patch wires onto adjacent pins which could be on a very small pitch like it might be 0.65 millimeter pitch or whatever the target IC or device happens to be so this sort of tip I would use for uh, for getting access to uh, to pins that I just I don't have much clearance around them and that's why it's discolored because I do use this tip and I use a few different styles of tip but the thing is to learn about what uh, what's the most appropriate tip to use in any particular situation and uh, and not be not just think there is one style that is the best and it's always the one that's the smallest and that gives you the most accuracy because that's not necessarily the case so what I find is that the K-type is the one that I leave in my iron almost all the time and then very occasionally I'll switch to a different type just to do very specific things like if I've got different needs now I'm just going to solder so solder a connector onto here and onto here I should say and then I'm going to see what I've missed in the chat because I've been ignoring all of you I'm sorry about that okay so we now have the AP8C socket on here so if I plug this in Pachoing, you can see that it's now powered up because this cable still has the power from my lab supply and this is running Tasmoda, so it should now be actually connected to my network and it'll be um, connected to MQTT and ready to do stuff. But first, I'm going to solder on the connector that goes on here. And what is it? It's a 12-way, so it's a 6x2 or a 2x6 socket and I don't know if I have any of those I might just have to use a pair of 1x6 headers I do have uh, I've got you know 20 uh, 2 by 40 uh, sockets so what I could do is cut down a big one but I won't this time what I'll do is I'll just get a couple of 1x6 sockets and stick them side by side. So I'm going to use a couple of these. What else do I have in my... This is my little random headers box. My local cache, 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 however you want to pronounce it. I've always pronounced it as cache. But that's probably because I learned about the word from books and didn't hear anyone pronounce it until I was like 20 years old or something so I don't even know how it's meant to be pronounced it's uh, I know that a lot of people say cache so like a memory cache and that always sounds weird to me just because from the time I was um, I don't know when did I learn about caches or caches I was probably about 10 years old reading up a about computer architectures and things so I read about it in a book and thought because of the way it was spelt and I think because it's probably French origin is my guess and it's not cache as in c-a-c-h-e-t so it is my 10 year old or whatever it was brain probably said oh that's probably meant to be pronounced cache because it's got the E on the end and I've probably been mispronouncing that my entire life uh, okay 
Get some connections on there. And now I'm probably going to have t people telling me how I'm meant to be pronouncing that. So, uh, where's my solder? I was just using a little random off cut. Now it's time for everybody to be criticizing my soldering technique. Come on. Now I found that. So I'm just doing this under the camera right now, and my head is way back from what I'm doing, so I'm not actually, I'm keeping my head back out of the camera, because if I move my head, you can see my, uh, my head in the, getting in the way, so I'm kind of sitting back, not able to see very well what I'm doing, and also in recent years, I've been doing pretty much all soldering under the microscope, even things like you know, things like this. This is a 0.1 inch pitch header, which is huge. There's no, pro I've got no problem doing that. In fact, like I sold the 0603 parts just directly without the microscope, no problem. But I just find that doing it under the microscope gives me so much of a better view of what's going on. So now we've got that header. So that plugs into the button carrier board like that but of course that has to be done after the carrier board has been attached to the buttons because they get soldered on from this side and you can't get the soldering iron in there so the, um, the assembly sequence would be to drill a hole in the switch panel mount the buttons through the holes and then put this button board onto the back of the buttons solder it in place and then get the controller board, attach it, and then we should be good to go. Now, one of the reasons that I actually changed this design, if I put these side by side, you should be able to see the difference, is the gap between the holes. Now, I've made this, the new PCB is slightly longer, and I made, even though it doesn't need it from an electrical point of view, there's plenty of room. I could have made this board shorter, but, it's um, it's a mechanical limitation and uh, so these bolts that go through the corner here with the little spaces that hold the two boards together in that sandwich arrangement what I found is that the body of the button that comes through the front panel is too close just here so I'll try to recenter it is too close to where the head of the bolt comes out and so on this particular one, I've got one bolt into each of these diagonal corners. And if you look through the hole there, you can actually see the body of this switch through the hole. It just gets in the way. So what I did on this one was just extend it by a couple of millimeters. And if I get it aligned about there, actually I'll align the bottom one. So you can see that the bottom holes are aligned. The top hole on the new board is longer. So when it's centered, I'll move it down a little bit, should be about centered now. You can see that the mounting holes have been moved um, out by a couple of millimeters each. And that should be enough to give it clearance over the, um, over the bodies of those switches. And if you look at this one, so this is the three button version of the, the button carrier board. You can see that it's longer because the position of the switches, to get the spacing right, they have to come out to this distance. So in this case, it's gonna look a little bit strange because the top board is shorter than the bottom board. When they are attached together, so move that out of the way, you can see that the button carrier board is longer than the control board, but the mounting holes line up so that I will be able to put a little spacer or something in there and um, put some bolts through and mount it. Now oh, you can see that the silk screen ran off the edge of the PCB just there because the body of the switch comes past the end. And then the other versions of the board which I haven't even opened. Let's open one of these. Right, this is the two button board. 
you can see that once again this one could have been shorter but it's as long as it needs to be to accommodate those corner mounting holes so those are the two those are two of the button panels in front of each other there's the four button let's grab that one out just for curiosity's sake move that packet open and there's a four button panel so we've got one so we've got a two button a three button and a four button all side by side and in fact are these two i think they're the same dimensions yeah they are so the two and the four button are the same dimensions but the three button is slightly longer to allow for that bigger gap and you can see that the gap here between the these two buttons <clears throat> falls it's um it's bigger than the gap here between each of the buttons on the three-way <clears throat> but it's less than the distance from the end buttons and uh, that gap was just picked because it comes up aesthetically <clears throat> excuse me as looking okay when it's mounted on this face plate and uh, I also put some dimensions on here oh and one other little thing this is something else I've mentioned in the past if you look in the center of the footprint here for these buttons you can see that there's a hole let's see if you can see it there just there see there's a mechanical hole right through the middle of the footprint that's actually got nothing to do with the uh, the footprint for the button I put those holes in there so that you could use a pen to mark up your face plate so if you've got a got one of these wall plates and it's blank all you have to do is grab the PCB stick it on the wall plate and you get it centered I mean I'm not actually going to do this so I'm not going to worry too much about getting it accurate but you just get it centered and then you grab yourself like something like a felt tip marker pen and you just put it through the hole and put it through the hole make a mark and then you'll have um, drill holes marked on your uh, on your faceplate and they will be perfectly accurately aligned to the position of the switches so the switch footprints become the mechanical mounts they become the uh, the drilling guide for the plastic faceplate so I can't remember where that idea came from I did that on one of my really early light switches about 10 years ago and I've done it a couple of times since. I use the PCB as a mechanical guide. So yeah, I, I just find that's a really handy little technique. And the other thing is that you can see that I've put dimensions on here. So in this case, 30 millimeters is the center, the center gap. And uh, the idea with this is to make the PCBs kind of self-documenting to some extent. So if you grab this PCB and you wanted to uh, make up a, a light switch, you don't have to go hunting or you know grab out the calipers and measure what's the gap between this you can just look at it and go hmm, 30 millimeters easy and on this one what is that one 24 millimeters center to center and on this one i've got 24 millimeters center to center horizontally 30 millimeters vertically so all the dimensions are shown directly on the pcb and the pcb is a drilling guide so where are we at with this all right so we've got the control board is now uh, all soldered up we've got the connection through to here so the next logical thing to do is to solder the switches onto here so that we can do some testing in the same way that i've done some testing for this but i'm not going to do that right now on the live stream because I would have to go out into the back of the garage and use the drill press and mess around doing a few other things and um, I can't really show you that and it's probably not that exciting to watch anyway so where although we can take a little bit further what I could do is I can grab a couple of the buttons and just physically hold them in position on here and I can't remember how I've got this configured. So I've got Tasmoda installed 
but I don't know if I've got it configured to drive the RGB LEDs yet. Uh, let's see, we can always find out. Let's plug one in and see what happens. So I've got a, I've got boxes and boxes of these RGB LEDs here. So these are the, the boards. Oh, so these are the buttons that I had custom made in China with the uh, with the assistance of John Boshua and one of the LifeX um, yeah so John Boshua from LifeX was in the markets with me on a Sunday I think it was and the market was pretty much deserted and we found a um, an outlet so we found a the OnPow outlet in the market and uh, John got someone else from LifeX on the phone to act as an interpreter and we negotiated having these uh, these RGB LED switches custom made for me which was very very cool so which way around does it go uh, <laughs> there is no dot so it either goes that way or that way I need to look up the footprint which luckily I have open so uh, okay, Don't, I think it goes that way, but I'm not going to risk powering it up. So let's have a quick look at the carrier board. And while I'm over here at the computer, I might as well also check the chat, because I've been ignoring you for so long. Smart RGB 3.board, that is the one I want. Okay, so... Which side of the board are we looking at? Okay, we're looking at it from the uh, we're looking at it from the back, which is the opposite side from the uh, from the buttons, which means we switch back to overhead view. So we've got positive up there. We've got green down there. Yeah, that looks okay. So that goes that way. It is aligned the logical way. That's nice. So the OnPower logo is readable when the board is up the right way. All right, I just need to remember that for future. I probably need a better way of designating this. In fact, what I should do is put the color markings on the back of the PCB here to match the markings that are on the back of the button. So put uh, B, G, etc. on the PCB right here. So when you're holding the switch, it's very obvious if you've got it back to front. So, uh, yeah. I haven't done that, but I really should. Alright, so it goes that way. And then that goes on there. And then, let's power it up and see what happens. In fact, I'll just keep that aligned. Plug power in there. So we've got power on the controller. That goes in that way. And we don't have anything coming up on the RGB LED, which is kind of what I expected because I hadn't yet configured Tasmoda to tell it what IO pin to use and the fact that it's got a WS2812 connected to it and all of that sort of thing. So I need to go through the process of doing that configuration. All right, I'm going to do that when I'm not on the live stream. Although maybe I should live stream those sorts of things as well. Because that might be interesting. Uh, for some people anyway. It's uh, one of those things where I'd be sitting doing it for an extended period of time and probably spending a lot of time just looking and thinking and so not great live stream material um oh righty i've got so much chat to scroll back through all right what have i been missing um well firstly some hellos to some people <laughs> What time is it? Okay, it's an hour into the live stream and I'm just starting with the chat and the hellos. Uh, so, from Bogota, Colombia, Francisco. Hey, welcome. And Kirby from USA in Ohio. 
Uh, Johnny Bergdahl, Dana, <laughs> you're here, fantastic. And um, many other people. Mike, good to see you here. All right, so what, what chat messages have I been missing? Bluetooth on the Pi itself. Uh, okay, so there's some general chat going on about Bluetooth and Zigbee. Looks like there are some... Oh, and <laughs> hey, James from Milwaukee. Uh, and Andras from Hungary. All right. All right, so there's some interesting discussion there about compiling the ESP32 version of Tasmoda to act as a gateway. I actually haven't installed Tasmoda on an ESP32 yet. That is something that I would like to do. It's, uh, it's really cool that the um, that Tasmoda now supports the ESP32. It, it actually puts the project in a bit of an interesting and difficult position because the thing is that for cost reasons, the vast majority of smart switch devices still use an ESP8266 or 85, and that has the inherent limitations that Tasmoda can, <clears throat> can really only do things or add features that work on those processes. And anything that's done to support the ESP32, at this point anyway, has to be kind of a secondary um, effort because if you, um, so if the developers add a whole lot of things and they've come to rely on features of the ESP32, it means that Tasmoda is no longer useful or as useful on the um, on regular things like the Sonoff and all of the, the various knockoffs. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a tricky position to be in. Uh, ESP32 is support is cool because it does mean that it'll be possible to do things like use Bluetooth in, um, in Tasmoda and open up all sorts of other possibilities and even just working around lim memory limitations. So one of the big problems with Tasmoda development is just running into the limits of the ESP8266, mostly in terms of memory. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not so much in terms of things like RAM or processor speed. It's more just the fact that the majority of uh, of smart switch devices are designed with a very small amount of flash memory um, to, just to save money. Like every cent matters when you're making millions of something. So uh, so it often has to fit into, well, and the ESP8285 with its fixed internal flash is the classic target use case. So Tasmoda really has to run on an ESP8285, which puts a hard box around the capabilities of your target and uh, and adding features that are on some devices and not others is why Tasmoda now has so many binaries available. So there's the, the basic Tasmoda binary, which is the default, and that is what gives you regular functionality on regular devices. But then if you want things like display support or certain sensors or certain I.O. peripherals, then you often have to go to a, either a custom build to turn those things on, which means you have to sacrifice something and turn something else off, <clears throat> or get one of the pre-built binaries that are for those particular uh, target devices. So, yeah, anyway, random thoughts. Uh, okay, so uh, Station 240 said, I found those small terminals to be unreliable for CAN connections. Uh, I think this is in relation to the 3.5 millimeter screw terminals that I was showing earlier. Wherever it is, got them still on the bench there. This one. So the 3.5 millimeter screw terminals. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't. I don't think I've ever used these screw terminals or any screw terminal for can connections. But that's interesting to know that they can be unreliable. So thanks, Station 240. Uh, so, okay, so a question about this smart switch. Uh, Jay After Dark said, so when you push the button, is it a pull up or is it actually sending a message through RX and TX? 
it is a pull, well, there is a pull up resistor and the switch is a pull down. Now let's have a quick look at, where are we going? Desktop. Okay, desktop, come on, switch view, that's it. All right, so this is the three-way button uh, carrier board. And if I switch to the schematic version, uh, okay, so ignore all of this, everything that's in gray that I'm telling you not to look at. And right now you're looking at it because I'm highlighting it. Don't look at it. Stop it. Stop looking at it. The part to look at is the switch just here. Let's look at this switch as an example. So this is one of the buttons. This is button two in this case. And you can see that it's got ground on one side. It's normally open to connect it to ground and the other side comes along to this connection. So from the point of view of the control PCB, the RGB switch, so if you ignore the LED part of it, the illumination part of it, just the input side, so pressing that button, what it's doing is taking this pin and shorting it to ground. And then if we look at uh, the control side of it, and where are we? So we've got the connector here. If we look down at this connector, you can see button two, and this is where that is coming in. So that same button I was just looking at on the carrier comes in on this connection. So where does it go from there? Button two comes in right here. And you can see that there is a 22K pull up, and it then goes through a 1K resistor into the gate of and in MOSFET and uh, I think I've talked about this a little bit before I won't go into it in great detail now this whole arrangement you might look at this and have a bit of a what the hell moment you can see that there is another 22k pull up so we've got a 5 volts on this side we've got a 3.3 volts on this side we've got two 22k pull ups and we have the connection coming out here GPIO 13 which is going into the ESP8266 and we've got the FET here. So normally what happens is that when this button is not pressed, we have this gate on the FET pulled up to five volts through these two resistors, which means it will be turned on, which means this goes to ground, which means that we will have a low on the GPIO 13. When you press the button, it grounds it, which turns off the transistor, which pulls this up, to 3.3 volts which means we have a high so from the point of view of the ESP8266 this is acting as an inverter that's not actually the purpose of it I would have preferred it not to be an inverter but that's just the way it is so um, when you press the button you get a high input on the ESP8266 when you let go of it you get a low input on the ESP8266 but the reason we've got this in here and that this circuit exists is that this is not the only place that the button to net is connected. So where do we have it? Over here, look at this. This is the AP8C connector and button two also comes here. So the result of this is that button two is pulled to five volts normally through this local pull up resistor and that means that this pin here is at five volts normally and when you press it it goes to ground and this connection goes to ground so at the other end of this wire this uh, this it's like ethernet cable but it's not i'm just using a twisted pair cable with rj45 connectors on it ap8c connectors so at the other end of this is a light switch controller and it can detect pull down events on these data lines which are not data lines they're just the switches and uh, that's the reason for this circuit so this acts as a bit of an isolation it allows direct connection to from the button to the remote light switch controller so the light switch controller can read the state of the buttons regardless of what is happening with the processor so it doesn't matter if the, the ESP8266 is actually doing anything at all 
in fact it could be totally failed as long as there is power to this you can detect button press events at the other end of the wire because you are detecting this net going between 5 volts when it's pulled high and 0 volts when it's pulled down so if you treat that like an open collector input then you can read it but the ESP8266 can also read it in a way that's isolated from this particular part of the uh, the connection here so it gives us two different ways to deal with button events either locally in the ESP8266 or at the other end of the wire and that is the reason so <clears throat> Uh, uh, yeah, so Johnny Bergdahl said Tasmoda supports BLE. I think it's time for me to read up on what they've been up to. I only use Tasmoda on my Sonos. Yeah, the Tasmoda project is crazy. It is so active. It's one of those things where the original idea was conceptually reasonably simple. The, the whole idea of replacement firmware to go on a Sonoff. And it's got a huge community around it now and it's got so many developers working on it with lots of ideas it's turning into one of those universal firmware things where you can make it do pretty much anything um, yeah okay so um, oh unexpected maker said hey folks listening but not in front of computer pnp so uh, because Sion can't see me. I'll wave to him. Hey, Sion. <laughs> uh, he'll be having lots of fun with his new pick and place machine, which uh, looks amazing. So I'm so happy that you've got a machine that's doing the job for you now, Sion. Uh, yeah, all right. So uh, drr, drr, what have we got? Uh, oh, lots of comments about solder tips. This shows you how far behind I am on the chat. Depends on the surface area I'm soldering. Yes, etc. Currently have a semi needle. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Dana. Uh, so started with the usual cone. Ended up getting pretty used to a stand uh, to a round beveled. Yeah, round bevels are very popular. That's a good choice as well. Um, for some reason, I've just ended up with the uh, with the K type tip as my preference. And I, I think the reason for my preference for the k-type over the round beveled is the fact that i can get such a different profile from it just by rotating the soldering iron oops so i can have the soldering iron in my hand and just little twist and all of a sudden it's like i've got a totally different tip on the iron and being able to get down to the fine point when you need it can be useful and doing that with the round bevel is a bit harder but yeah, round bevels are very good for drag soldering and a whole lot of other um, types of soldering as well. Uh, oh, John Spencer <laughs> said, I still prefer the needle tip for surface mount, but I'm growing to like the square blade on my TS-100. Yes, shout out for the TS-100. So I have one right here. And I got this just a little while ago. I'm gonna chuck it down here and switch views again. I love this TS-100. Where have we got? What have we got? Desktop? No. Overhead. I want that camera. Okay, so this, I need to find my cursor again too. There we go. So uh, this is my relatively new TS100 and it's the, so the TS100 has the barrel jack in it. There is also a TS80, which is a kind of similar design, but it's got a USB-C connector. So you can do like USB power delivery like PD stuff, and they, yeah, they're kind of similar. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. I personally chose the TS100, and I got it with this lead. So it's got the barrel jack connector that goes in there to the XT60 connector on here. And as I've said on said previously, I'm switching over to XT60s for just about everything. I've got, uh, so connections for my lab power supplies are now XT60 connected to the bench there. And I've got leads hanging up here. So I've got uh, like this one, for example, I can just reach up and grab it. It's XT60 to alligator clips. 
and I've got XT60 to barrel jack and of different sizes and uh, yeah, all sorts of different things. And XT60 extension cables up to like four meters in length. So what I can do is plug into my lab power supply here, plug this in on the other end, and now I've got a four meter long lead to my soldering iron. Or I can just plug this into a battery from my drone. So uh, I've got these, I and mean, these are not the ideal voltage to be running the TS uh, 100, but I've got these, uh, these 3S battery packs. So what I can do is just plug it into here and now press go. Oh, and I've got the new firmware on here as well. So I put on the open source firmware. And so now I've got a totally portable soldering solution, which I can take anywhere. And this is actually the use case that I ordered this iron for. I wanted to be able to pick this up and go and work on the pick and place machine or work on you know some device that's on the central bench and having my normal soldering irons tethered to the bench was a bit of a pain. So having this portable solution is really good. I'm just going to pull the power on that now and try to remember not to burn myself on this because it'll be hot. Okay, so I ordered this one specifically with, I think it's called a KL tip. It's a mini K style tip. So uh, I forgot to turn off my soldering iron earlier. All right, so this one is hot. I'm gonna not touch this. But this, <laughs> you can see the bad shape of the tip. So this is the tip that I've just been using for, uh, for doing those connections you were seeing a minute ago. I really want the new tips to arrive. I've ordered a, a packet of 10 new tips. So you can see the K style tip on the, the larger one on my regular Hakko iron. And you can see the mini K tip that is on my TS100. And this mini K tip, I really, really like it. So there have been a few times that I've been working on stuff here on the bench and actually pull out the TS100 and use this as my preferred iron, even though I've got, I've actually got three other soldering irons on the bench right here. And I end up grabbing this little portable iron, which is kind of bonkers. But these are surprisingly good. I'm going to hang it back up around the corner. And I'll kill that fan so that it's not buzzing in my ear constantly. Now, where were we? Back to here. Okay, so I was talking about soldering and checking the chat. Uh, oh, Mike said, doing water changes on your aqu aquarium. Cool. Aquariums. Plural. Uh, yeah, so my daughter recently set up a a fairly large aquarium in her room so we put up some uh, some large rack to hold that anyway let's not get into that subject what am i talking about all right so uh, austin's creations okay so austin says i use c concave and d chisel tips most often for smd i have a hot air station and the solder oven i don't often use a soldering iron for smd yeah that's a good point so I use hot iron, hot air as well. Um, hot air is right here, always in reach. Uh, so I don't, I don't generally use a soldering iron for hot air. Oh, sorry, soldering iron for surface mount assembly. It's more for things like patching in uh, bodge wires and uh, putting connectors on and things like that, obviously. Hot air is more useful for general surface mount work. <laughs> Peter Kirchhoff said, oops, I squirreled him. <laughs> Chasing the squirrels. Um, uh, <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to try skipping through a fair bit of the chat. Um, mm, mm, mm. All right, I've got to try to catch up. Um, oh yes, this is a very good point regarding soldering. Magic Blue Smoke said, that's why when soldering pins, you should always add solder on the opposite side of the pin than the iron is. 
yeah, uh, that is a, a point that I should have said something about earlier when I was talking about the four items that you have to get in. So soldering iron comes in from one side, solder comes in from the other side into the joint, and that way as it wicks through the joint uh, towards the soldering iron, like chasing the heat as it will tend to do, it will tend to go onto the joint. So you don't put the solder and the soldering iron in together. You put them in opposite sides and let one feed into the other. Although you often have to sort of brush it across and touch it to get a little solder bridge initially to get the thermal transfer going into the joint. Uh, yes, so uh, Lani118 said that K tip is massive. So that's the, uh, the type of tip that I've been using. Yes, and um, that is, uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna chase a squirrel then, but I will not. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, oh, so Dana said, um, so this is talking about the pronunciation of cash versus cash. Fred Flintstone said pronounced cash. Uh, and Magic Blue Smoke says, I, pref I say cash because it's more f <laughs> fair more fun to say, I agree. Uh, Dana said cash here too, and seems to be a lot of Australians who do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Johnny Bergdahl said switching to cash cachet now, cachet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I still don't even know. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm going to keep saying cache just because it sounds better. It is more fun to say. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, um, where I, <laughs> I tapped the wrong thing. And, oh, hang on. I saw something interesting there about Tasmatizer. Oh, Magic Blue Smoke said, you can't use Tasmatizer when you do it though. Ask me how. Is that in relation to loading the ESP, loading Tasmoda onto the ESP32? Possibly. I'm not sure. Mm. <laughs> Station 240 said, I love it when a stream is planned in advance. <laughs> the extent of my planning was to set an alarm. <laughs> that was it. If I make it to the stream, <laughs> then that's a win. Um, oh, Johnny Bergdahl said, you may want to mod me, John. Yes, Johnny, you really should be a mod. So it sounds like there are some things you need to take care of. Oh, put user in timeout. No, I will not do that. Add moderator. Okay, Johnny, you should now be a moderator. Um, and James, thanks for taking care of it. I didn't even see whatever those messages were. There were, a, looks like there are a bunch of messages that have been deleted and I don't know what it was about. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter. All right, so let's see. Uh, I'm back to catching up. There, there is the topic about the solder that I mentioned right at the start of this live stream. I would like to, <laughs> unexpected maker said just ran into wave back. Um, all right, so there's, I'm almost at the end, I'm almost caught up. I'm just scanning quickly through the chat. Once I get to the end, I'm gonna ask a question because I want other people's opinions and I'm particularly interested in Sion's opinion on something, but let's see, all right, so. Um, I have my good, would nice to be portable. Yeah, good make good soldering irons. Uh, so I oh, uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> what battery is that? Okay, so unexpected maker said, What battery is that? Sorry, I was listening but didn't see. It's a 5400 milliamp hour 3S LiPo. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a 5,000 milliamp hour. So 11.1 volt, which is 3S 60C. It's basically just a big ass drone battery 
and I've got a couple of these um, just up there. You can see that white controller there, that is the controller for a, um, a DJI drone. So there's a Phantom just up there, uh, just across there. That is the controller for a homebrew drone and that's what these batteries are from. So um, that one is running ArduPilot on a little STM based flight controller and different other things and it uses these batteries. So that's why I have that one. Oh, Liney118 said the Mini K-Tip is a KU. Yes, thank you. So um, <laughs> Station240 said expect an answer in 10 minutes. He's way <laughs> way behind in the chat yeah all right so uh, chase the squirrels chase them all right now there is an interesting question from roger 10 4 and this is such a squirrel i'm not sure i'll get into this right now maybe this would okay. The question was, can you explain the steps to commercializing a board from a late stage prototype? That is um, a uh, <laughs> that is a very big question, and I think that would be a really interesting one to discuss when I have someone else on the stream. Maybe that is something that um, Sion could jump on and the two of us can talk about it from our uh, different perspectives and experiences. So uh, that, yeah, that would be a cool topic, but I think it would be too big to get into now. Now, okay. Um, Sion said, doesn't the TS100 need 24 volts? It takes up to 24 volts, but it doesn't need it. What is the spec? I think it basically runs anything from like 10 volts to 24 volts. And if you run it at 24 volts, you get faster heating. It basically performs better, but you can stick a 3S LiPo on it and it works perfectly fine. Uh, if I had a, <clears throat> if I had a 6S LiPo, that would be perfect, but I don't. I have the 3S LiPos on that drone <clears throat> and I'm just using what I've got. Yep. Aha, uh, Magic Blue Smoke said 12 to 24, but it will take most voltages over nine. Yes. And there is a setting in the software where you can um, you can set the safe lower limit. So that depending on what type of battery you've got, you don't want it to drain the battery. And if the battery doesn't have a built-in self-protection circuit, the soldering iron, so the TS100, is capable of having a cutout point. So you can say, I'm using a 3S LiPo, and it will know once it gets below a certain point, it should turn itself off. So it's, yeah, it's very cool. Uh, okay, so the, uh -huh. see on, cool. Sure, happy to have a chat on stream. All right, I think that is a, uh, a very good topic for a future. So uh, Michael Hunt said 3S is 12.6 volts. Yes, depends on the state of charge. The, uh, I think the voltage that they specify on the packs themselves. So this one says 11.1 .1 volts on it. I think that is the cutoff voltage when it, it, the safe cutoff voltage when it's discharged and it charges to more than that. So it's actually more than 11.1 .1 volts. In fact, I wonder what it is. Let's chuck a multimeter on it and see what we've got right now. I don't know what the state of charge is. So it's saying 11.645 volts at the moment, which is uh, it's probably a bit discharged. I should chuck this on there lipo charger and get it back up to a good state okay yeah magic blue smoke said 3.7 is the lower voltage at discharge 4.2 on higher end of charge exactly so 3.7 times 3 is 11.1 .1, which is three cells in series so that is the low end of the discharge all right um okay so uh, now, the thing that I was wanting to talk about way back at the start, as I've 
<laughs> as I'm sure everybody here knows. I had some problems with sinuses a while ago because of getting the actual trigger that time was getting a dose of solder fumes. And I've now moved my reflow oven through into that room and I've set up a whole new exhaust system and that is fine. I've been I've used the reflow oven since then and I haven't been able to smell anything at all. The new exhaust system sucks it all out very effectively. It's got about double the flow rate in terms of cubic feet per minute or cubic meters per hour or whatever the, the number is meant to be as the old exhaust system and it's running through a much bigger duct. So it's got better, um, <laughs> Johnny Boyd Dahl said, 85 minutes later, yes. So um, they, so I haven't had problems with the fumes since then, but this whole thing has made me stop and think a bit more about what I'm using. And one thing that's really annoyed me over a long period of time is the fact that I've been using a mishmash of different types of solder and I haven't been consistent, which means that getting things like profiles on the reflow oven sorted is a bit of a moving target. And <laughs> uh, Magic Blue Smoke said, John's the sort of guy you go over to his house for a beer and to move a couch or something in seven hours and a carton of beers later, the couch still isn't moved. <laughs> uh, I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. So, uh, um, what I've had in mind is um, there is a group of things that you need to work together, and so I've been I've got a a note basically to myself, which is making up a list of things. And in fact, where is this note? Let me see if I can find it. I've probably got it open in Evernote somewhere because I was just doing a little look through what I've got in the fridge back there where I store my solder paste and come on Evernote you'll open there it is all right so uh, so this is where my question for Sion in particular comes in and let's see, I just want to see if I can hide part of this. Can I hide that? Yes, I can. Good. All right. So now I can switch to this view. I don't even know if this view is going to be very useful, but let's try it. Okay. So this is a thing in Evernote. Um, so what I've done is made a, um, a little list of different things that I've been using in the past. So there are certain things that I need. Uh, I've, oh, cool. <laughs> See, I started answering in here, which is good. What I want to end up with is a list of five things. And those things need to work well together. And I need to be able to consistently buy the same thing over and over again. And those five things are solder paste in a syringe, solder paste in a tub, which is used for stencils, wire solder, just on a roll, tack flux and ultrasonic cleaning fluid. And I wonder if I can zoom this in. Oh, I can. Look at that. That's better. So what I, what I want is a solution to these five things. Now, at first glance, you might think that solder paste in a syringe and solder paste in a tub should just be the same thing. But that is not necessarily the case. Ideally, they should be compatible um, in terms of the same melting point and all of that sort of thing. But solder paste that comes in a tub that is used on stencils tends to have less um, carrier fluid in it. It's a little bit drier and it's a bit stiffer because as you're applying it using a stencil uh, and you, you scrape it across, it has this weird thing where as you apply pressure, it becomes less viscous. So it tends to flow better. And uh, so solder paste, if you take solder paste that you would use with a stencil and you just stick it inside a syringe, you find that it's really, really hard to dispense. It doesn't flow very well. So often 
the solder paste that you have in a syringe is different to the solder paste that you have in a tub, even if it's just that the composition of the carrier is different because the way you dispense it is different. Now, okay, so uh, John Spencer just made a point here which, I, which complicates this, which is I've pretty much moved exclusively to lead, to lead free. Um, it's had its challenges. Yes. Um, so <laughs> there could actually be this times two and that would really complicate things. But what I want to do is be consistent. And um, it also comes down to things like when I order PCBs, the, um, the surface finish options are uh, hassle, so hot air solder leveling, lead free hassle, and enig are the common. I mean, there are other surface finishes as well, but those are the three that are just you know typically available in the little check boxes on the order form. And if I'm doing uh, if I'm doing production boards, particularly with fine pitch parts, I normally go for enig because it gives you a perfectly flat surface. Whereas uh, if you have hassle, so hot air solder leveling, there will be slight imperfections in the surface. It'll have little um, waves and things in it. So that's a bit of a pain. So for hand assembled prototypes, I often just order. In fact, what are these? Yeah, so these ones. These are boards that I ordered for hand assembled prototypes and these are hassle. So hot air solder leveling, which is why the pads are silver. But for production boards, I usually use Enig. Uh, so electroless nickel immersion gold. So, hmm, back to the point. Ideally, what I would like to do is go lead free. And I want to be consistent. So instead of, at the moment I've got, um, that's a little bit hard for you to see. You, can, you don't really have a, a good view, but up here on the bench, I've got the roll. This is the regular um, 6337 that I just grab down whenever I'm doing hand soldering. So that's leaded solder. Next to it, I've got um, SAC 305, which is um, a silver solder. So that's lead free in the same diameter. These are both 0.7 millimeter diameter. I've also got a roll of, what is this one, 0.4. So this is 0.4 millimeter diameter uh, SAC 305. So silver solder once again. And those are the ones that I typically reach for when I'm just using, just doing hand assembly with wire type solder. But what I would like to do, the goal is to have one type of wire solder and one type of flux one type of solder paste, etc., and the cleaning fluid needs to be compatible. So this is one area where the whole question of no clean comes in. And um, uh, I should be looking at comments here because people will be having some uh, suggestions probably. All right, uh, flux, yeah. So Sion made the very good point. The flux and the chemicals and the lead free will kill you faster than lead. Yeah, so that's part of it as well. There is, and then there is ROHS compliance. So if I'm going to be selling boards, then ideally it needs to be lead free because you want to get that ROHS uh, compliance thing happening. So yeah, ROHS is a restriction on hazardous substances. If you haven't come across that before, it's an EU directive that uh, re it limits the types of chemicals and materials that you can use in manufacturing products for sale to the public. And you to achieve ROHS compliance, you can't use leaded solder. I think that's the summary anyway. The story is probably a little more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. So, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> oh, John said, I mainly switched because I ran out of leaded. Um, yeah, so where am I? Okay, back to my desktop. This is where I want to end up. What I would like to be able to do is put a part number 
or a very specific thing after each of these items and know that this whole family of things is going to work together. Now, ultrasonic cleaning fluid, this is an interesting one. And this comes into the question of regular solder versus no clean solder. And if you, if you look at a lot of solder, you will see that it says, like in its part number, it will have dash NC or it'll say no clean. And the reason for that is that the flux that is typically used in solder is acidic. The way it works is that it etches into any corrosion and things that might be on the surface of the contacts that you're trying to solder. And that's why uh, the flux is there. It's to, um, it's to eat into the surface and allow the solder to bond properly. <clears throat> now, with regular solder, like rosin-based solder, if you use that flux and it's not and the flux can be in the solder wire itself like if you're using wire solder or if you're using solder paste the flux will be mixed with it you don't need to add it yourself but if you solder the joint and the flux hasn't entirely burned off and there is still some there some residue sitting around the joint it's still acidic and it's still going to keep etching in so if you have soldered a joint using regular flux then ideally you're meant to clean it afterwards to remove any of that flux residue. Otherwise that residue is going to continue to etch into the material, uh, like of the metal or the joint or whatever. So you need to get rid of it. You can't just leave it on the board. And that is why NC flux or no clean flux was invented. It's so that you can make a soldered joint and then you can just put the board aside and ignore it. And it might look a bit crappy like there will be flux and residue around the joint but it's not going to be actively damaging anything to leave it there it, aesthetically it doesn't look that great and ideally you want to get rid of it but um, but it's not actually going to be a problem long term for the reliability of the device which can be the case with regular flux so uh, yeah so that's the reason that you see a lot of flux is listed as NC or no clean it means it's safe to leave on but there are also fluxes that are water-based and there are some that are uh, rosin based or whatever they need some kind of a solvent to remove them so you can get solder that is water cleanup as in you can get an ultrasonic bath and put uh, distilled water in it and then you chuck your PCBs in and the water is sufficient for cleaning the, um, the flux off it, or you can, get, uh, you can get flux that needs a type of solvent to remove it. And there are places like uh, Chem Tools, I think it is, uh, somewhere else. Anyway, there was a place I was looking at up in Sydney. There are, places, there are plenty of places around where you can buy the cleaning fluid that you put into an ultrasonic cleaner so you put all your PCBs in the ultrasonic cleaner after they've been soldered and they come out looking perfectly clean. But the question of what you put in the ultrasonic cleaner is going to depend on the type of solder paste that you have and therefore the type of flux that it has. So if you have, um, so generally from what I've seen, no clean flux, you can't clean effectively with water. You need the flux cleaner, whereas other fluxes like water-based fluxes or water clean fluxes are not no clean but you only need water to clean them anyway sorting all of this out can be it's one of those things where you you approach this problem and think this is going to be simple and then you start finding all of these complications if you use this particular solder paste then it uses this flux and then you can't clean it with this but then that cleaning fluid that I need for that is not compatible with the um, the wire or the flux that's in the solder wire that I use for rework and it all gets very complicated so what I want is a list of these five things that I know are going to work together that are going to give consistent results and uh, that that are good anyway that's the problem <laughs> it's not the solution I don't have the solution yet I've got uh, different things that I've been looking at and this list is not complete this is just some 
stuff that I copied and pasted. I've got uh, many, many browser tabs open with different supplier data sheets and material, material safety data sheets and things, looking at all these different things. And uh, I've heard so many people use the, um, the GC10. Who makes that stuff? I can't remember. I was looking at that. Uh, and I can't remember who it is. GC10 solder paste. Let's see. GC, it's some really big name. And when I, when it comes back to me, solder paste, I'm going to think, of course, that's who it is. GC10 is made by Loctite. Yes, that's right. So Loctite make a, um, uh, yeah, make this solder paste called GC10. And... Uh, now GC has the, it's the, the corniest acronym in the world. So GC stands for Game Changer. It's the solder paste that is supposed to be a game changer. And from what I've heard, it really is. It's the reports that I've heard from people that have used it is that it's amazing. It's like magic compared to other types of solder paste. And it comes in different sizes. So the other thing, if you're looking at solder paste and you haven't seen this before, is the balls in the solder paste come in different sizes. So you can get very, very fine balls in the solder paste, or you can get uh, larger ones. I'm kind of tempted to get some solder paste out and show you under the microscope what it looks like. Because if you haven't, sol if you haven't seen unsoldered solder paste before, it is kind of amazing. Oh, Sion said Loctite GC10 is a bitch to clean. That is very interesting to know. Okay, so... Uh, it looks like, um, uh, looks like Sion has provided a bunch of feedback in the chat, so I'm going to have to go through this as well. <laughs> yeah, as Magic Blue Smoke said, Sion's finally able, finally glad to be able to talk about this crazy amount of specific knowledge he's gained over the last few years. Yeah, so after going through trials of so many different things... And uh, Sion has now assembled far more boards than personally than I have. So I defer to his experience and knowledge in this area. Uh, I think I've, I've had more boards made, but done in factories. And uh, not all that many that I have assembled personally. I've probably only assembled, I don't know, 5,000 boards personally. Um, just as a guess off the top of my head. And Sion, I think, has done far more than that. So, um, so Sion is the expert here. So, um, what I've been looking at, yeah, these, these ones that I've got listed here, this is what I currently have. <clears throat> uh, these things here that are highlighted. Is, this is what's sitting in my fridge right at this moment. Apart from the no, t no clean tack flux because that doesn't require refrigeration. That's sitting on my bench. So I've got a couple of different types of solder paste. I've got leaded paste and unleaded paste. Two different types of unleaded paste. <clears throat> and there is another one as well. So another one I haven't listed here is that I have a tub of, um, of an unleaded paste that I got while I was in China, and it, uh, I don't even know what it is. It's some miscellaneous thing that I got from a market. So I don't have a data sheet on it or anything. And I haven't bothered listing it here because uh, even if I wanted to buy the same thing again, I probably wouldn't be able to find it. And I only want... So in my definitive list of things to use, I only want things that I can reliably reorder, ideally from an Australian supplier. It doesn't have to be Australian brand, but something that I can get from an Australian supplier or from DigiKey or somewhere like that, that I know that I can just order the same thing and get exactly the same thing every time. Alrighty. So, uh, oh yeah, see on set almost 16,000 boards now, <laughs> yes. You've done a lot of boards. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, the okay, yes, the this one. So down on the bottom here, in the chat, Sion has just said he uses okay products, SAC 305NC, 
I think it might, could it be the same as this one? Let me see. I'm just going to open it and see if it's the same. It might be, it might not. All right, so this URL here is the one that Sion said he uses. And that may aim lead for ESAC 305. The other stuff I've got, is this the same? I'll open that one. Oi, wrong browser. That's not what I wanted. Change screens on me. All right, copy that. Anyway, it doesn't matter if it's the same or not. So I'll say, my answer is, Sion uses this. <laughs> and uh, so, no, that, no, the first link, okay. Uh, all right, so, no, the first link, not that one. What is that? This is my low temp, okay. Anyway, <laughs> your first link was correct. Okay, so the water-based one. Yep, all right, water-based. So this one is correct, I think. Let me see. Uh, I'm just gonna stick this into another browser window and see if that is the water-based cleanup. Come on, browser. Water-soluble, yes, yeah, so this first one is the water-soluble. This is water soluble, or water, I should say water cleanup. Because the solder isn't water soluble, technically. All right, so not that one is what you're saying. I'll delete that one. All right, so, uh, yes, cool. Well, thanks, Sion. <laughs> this is kind of strange. It's like the two of us are having a conversation and we have a few other people looking over our shoulders which is interesting. <laughs> Hopefully this is useful for people. So um, what I would like to do is when I've gone through this whole process and I've got a definitive list of things sorted out, uh, I'll report back because there might be other things that, um, uh, that other people are useful as now. <laughs> <laughs> Magic Blue Smoke said, my new podcast idea, The Melting Point with Sion and John, and they just test solder paste and fluxes together. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the Melting Point is, is a cool name for a podcast. I like that. It's kind of reminiscent of the amp hour. <laughs> uh, alrighty, so I need to work these out. And <clears throat> wire solder, of course, is the, the other thing. So tack flux. I've got this tack flux at the moment, which is this chip quick stuff. It's the no clean tack flux. And I, I like it in terms of its characteristics for, um, for what it's like to put onto the board and the way it performs. It, it works really well. This is, uh, this is pretty good stuff as far as tack flux goes. And I have a feeling that this might be the same flux that um, uh, Lewis Rosman uses. I can't remember. I've, um, I've looked up some of the stuff that Lewis uses in the past. And I think that's actually where I found out about this particular tack flux. So Lewis uses this for all his MacBook repairs and things. I might be wrong about that. He might use something different. But I think that's where I got that part number from. Uh, yeah, so, uh, this is water cleanup. So solder paste in a tub. I should start, um, making this a proper actual list. So let's stick this in here. So I now have an answer on the solder paste in a tub that I should use. Amtech. Ah, yes, Jack's Tech said Amtech. You're right. That is the brand he uses. Amtech NC559 V2TF. Ah, <laughs> and that is also what Sion uses. Alrighty, in that case, I am going to I grab 
that exact name and <laughs> a whole lot of people have corrected me all at the same time. So TechFlux, I'm going to ah, formatting. Formatting in Evernote is a pain. So there's a way to remove the formatting. What is it? Uh, Shift Command F or something? Yes, I remembered. I got it right. I had to look that up because I couldn't find how to remove formatting in Evernote a couple of days ago. So now I know that it is Shift Command F. So what I need to do is um, fill in some blanks here. Uh, let's say final list and this is kind of weird for a live stream <laughs> to be sitting here working something out but oh well maybe it is helpful for other people so um, cleaning fluid so I think this is all water soluble so basically the ultrasonic cleaning fluid in this case is just going to be like distilled water or whatever and there is stuff you can get from uh, now where is it there is the cleaning fluid uh, no, I don't have it here on my list, but I have it elsewhere. There is a water, there's a place in Sydney that sells cleaning fluid. Um, let me see, uh, solder cleaning fluid, Sydney. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, from Mechtronics, I think. Yeah, that, oh, from Chemtools. I think it might have been from Chemtools. Or it might have been Mechtronics. I don't know. Anyway, I will look that up. So ultrasonic cleaning fluid is not such a big deal if the if this is all water soluble. So that's fine. All right. So I need to find all right. Tac flux. I'm going to order some of that. I don't actually have that. I've never used the Amtech uh, Tac flux. Um, the cheap quick stuff is nice. I do like this. But uh, let's go with what the experts recommend. And Sion recommends it and Lewis recommends it. So Amtech it is. And the thing is that right now, so in the, where I am at the moment is I'm looking at this overall. So far, all of this has been very bitty. What's happened is that over time I've needed some solder. So I ordered a roll of solder and I needed some solder paste. So I just look up some solder paste and I order it and I've ended up with this mishmash of different things that I use and I've never really looked at it in a holistic way in terms of what are my specific requirements and make sure that I get all of the things that match each other that that are compatible and that are reproducible etc. So where I am at the moment is I have all of this stuff like I've got how many times? I've got five different types of solder paste at the moment. And as you can see, I've got three different rolls of um, solder wire up there and different fluxes. I've got, how many? I've got three different fluxes at the moment. The, um, the chip quick stuff is the one that I'm generally using, but I've actually got three different types of flux here. And it's all kind of random. <clears throat> so what I'm, the state I'm in right now is I want to look at this from the point of view of forget what I've got and be resigned to the fact that I might end up just throwing out or not using what I already have. What I want is to set up exactly the ideal combination of things. I want the ideal combination of the solder paste, solder wire, flux, etc. So that it's all consistent, it all works together, it's... Uh, it's got minimal impact in terms of my own health and fumes and environmental impact and those sorts of things as well and get it right and if there is stuff that I'm using right now that is not right and that is not compatible with that system then I'll dispose of it or give it to someone that can make use of it or whatever but I want to have a starting point where I have a definitive list of this is the the set of products that I'm going to use and that is what it is going to be from now on and I will only use those ones from now on <clears throat> I buy it oh chem tools okay so I chem tools cleaning them yes that's the stuff 
sorry, when I was looking a moment ago for the cleaning fluid from that Sydney supplier, uh, that was the one I was looking for. So I'm going to stick, uh, let me switch back to my desktop view here. So this product here, yeah, I've, um, this stuff I've had open in a, another, it's in one of the many browser tabs at the moment. So this Clinium stuff, I'll bring it over here. Eventually it'll load. So printed circuit board and electronic part cleaning solution. So this is the stuff that goes into the ultrasonic cleaner. And yeah, as Sihon said, he buys it in 20 liter plastic drums. So that is what I will get as the cleaning solution to go into the, um, the ultrasonic cleaner. All right. We seem to have a good start here on a list of compatible things. So what I need to do is work out solder paste in the syringe. So at the moment I've got some uh, chip quick unleaded solder paste in a syringe. In fact, I have a brand new unopened uh, syringe of this stuff. It's sitting in the fridge, never opened because I've still been finishing off the other one. So this particular one, the chem tools one, I've been finishing off and I've got this one, which I have never used sitting in the fridge. Maybe that will end up okay. I don't know. I'll give it a try. So that might end up being the product that drops into this one here. <clears throat> But if, um, if OK products have uh, something that is in a syringe equivalent to this one, <coughs> mm, excuse me, um, then it might make sense to use that. So what if uh, this one, let me drag this one across, this particular one. So this is the one that Sion was saying to use, except he gets it in bigger jars, in bigger tubs, and they've got yeah they make solder wire as well so lead free no clean solder wire 1.2 millimeter that's enormous that's like garden hose size but if there was something like that in around 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter look like look they got 0.65 no it's leaded leaded anyway i might end up going for something like the okay uh, solder wire as well get some of that just to see what it's like and um, where, uh, what am I looking for? Okay, so solder paste. Let's just go back to solder paste here and see if they offer this or a similar thing in a syringe. So they've got the SAC 305. Yeah, something like this. This looks all right. Lead free solder paste, no clean, lead 10 cc with plunger. Is that the difference in the price? Looks like it might be. So, Aim lead free, solder paste, no clean, 10, gr 10 gram syringe, 10 cc syringe with plunger. Okay. <laughs> uh, whichever way, solder paste. Uh, so uh, there's some cartridges, a couple of others. Which one have I got at the moment? No, it's not that one. So what I might end up doing is getting a syringe of this stuff lead free solder paste and use that as my replacement. But first I'm going to experiment. I'll try the, um, the chip quick stuff to see what it's like. So this one, let's put this one in. Let's uh, do this solder paste syringe, have this and I'll say, Maybe try this and I'll stick in that okay solder paste. And at least that way I'm getting the solder paste in the tub and the tube from the same supplier. And if I, so I'm gonna to need to check that a little bit more and just make sure that there aren't other variations of the uh, of solder paste that they offer and find the one that is most appropriate. Uh, hmm. All right. And then wire solder as well. So I'll have a look at what they've got in their lead free range. V 
because a soldering soldering with lead free solder sucks it's a <laughs> it's such a pain um what have i got uh, yeah i've got some other stuff up there i might persist with it but what i might also do is try switching leaded 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 related products anyway solders and fluxes yes let's have a look while i'm here i might as well lead free solder wire i'm clicking through something that you can't see right now maybe i'll just bring this across all right so this is the okay range of lead free solder wire um, they've got a variety of different widths here so two millimeter 1.6 1.2 one millimeter, etc. So this is all SN100C, no clean in that range. And then we've got SAC305 here, no clean. Now, in terms of diameter, the size that I prefer is generally, so I've got 0.4 millimeter and 0.7 millimeter. And uh, I find the 0.4 millimeter is just a little bit too small to be too thin it means that as you're feeding into a joint you've got to feed a lot to get enough into the joint <clears throat> the, the thinner your solder wire is the more control you've got over the quantity in the joint so uh, but i found that 0.7 millimeter is good i wouldn't go any bigger than that but something like 0.65 millimeter would be in the ballpark of what would be ideal for me Maybe as small as 0.5, but given that I generally use 0.7, I think 0.65 would be uh, the most comfortable. Lead free loads. No clean flux holder. Um, anyway, I'm not quite sure what the cleanup is on this. I will need to look into the... Well, it says it's no clean, which may not be ideal. Uh, uh, okay, so okay, just the shop front for chem tools. Yeah, so it's the same company. Um, now, all right, I'm just going to stick this in. This is going to require further investigation, but I'm going to put this into maybe try this. So that's the. Um, that's the lead-free solder wire. But I do have plenty of 0.7 millimeter lead-free at the moment, the SAC 305 solder wire. So I probably don't need to buy that right away. But I'm aiming towards having a standardized shopping list. So whenever any of these things run out, I just go to the shopping list and that is the stuff that I use to replace it with. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sion, and everyone else for your uh, uh, for your advice on that that's uh, that is really useful all right oh Peter Kirchhoff said I bought a little ultrasonic cleaner from Aldi together with Clinium works a treat cool thanks um, all right oh and Sion said I've been known to take from my 500 gram jar and put it into an empty syringe cool so if that works, that's fantastic. It means that it's one source of the solder paste, and then I can just decant some into a syringe. Um, yeah. So, uh, hmm. All right. Oh, and Johnny Bergdahl pointed out, most solder paste needs to be refrigerated. Yes, I do have some... Uh, so I do have a little fridge. In behind that door, there is a little... Uh, bar fridge essentially and that's where I keep my solder paste all sealed inside Ziploc bags inside plastic containers in the fridge and um, oh, Dodgy said Johnny's tempting me to go see what size wire I have <laughs> yeah well the the size of the solder wire that you use really depends on what sort of joints you're making so if you're working with uh, with touching up surface mount parts, like in the 0402, 0603 sort of size region, your requirement for solder wire is going to be very different to if you're doing bulk connections between large, uh, like large cable assemblies and you want to solder bits of wire together or 
to large terminals or something. So in that case, you would use a, a larger size. Um, oh, and uh, Sion pointed out something to be aware of. SAC 305 and GC10 stinks when reflowing. Yeah, so the ventilation is important. And uh, I think I have my ventilation pretty well sorted now. Ultimately, what I do want to do is get one of the conveyor type reflow ovens. Um, probably the same one as Sion has. But at the moment, I have the large drawer style reflow oven. And uh, with the... The fume hood that I've got over it at the moment, that seems to be working fairly well and with a good new exhaust system. It's uh, keeping all of the fumes out of here. Oh, interesting. So Jaxtech said SDG did a bunch of comparisons of solder and flux. Hmm, I should look that up. Um, all right, is this a brain fart moment? What does SDG stand for? Solder flux. I'm just going to see if I can find it. I'm sure it's something that I should know if... Oh, SDG Electronics. Oh, okay, here we go. So SDG number 55, what's the best solder for electronics? Uploaded by SDG Electronics. And SDG number 59 is what's the best flux for soldering? Awesome. All right, well, thanks for that tip, Jax Tech. I'm going to look at those videos and see what they recommend. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Iron Magic Blue Smoke said, if you guys sold the cups on military connectors, you need like 1.2 millimeter wire. Yeah, so doing connectors and things, typically you need much larger solder, uh, solder wire to be able to do it effectively. Uh, Liney 118, 1 a.m. here. <laughs> and um, Klein's, I'm asleep now, 2 a.m. <laughs> um, sorry to keep you up so late. It's about time for me to stop anyway, but thank you very much for uh, for coming along and staying up so late for the live stream. Now, there was something else I was going to mention. Okay, I will... Uh, I'm going to wrap this up in a second, but I will just mention in passing. Uh, yesterday I got a... Um, uh, over the last couple of days, I've actually spent quite a lot of time on the data logging and reporting video. And I know I said this last week as well. <laughs> In fact, last Sunday I said conceivably by the end of the day it could be uploaded. And it has taken so long to get through these last sections. It's, um, so <laughs> I've been kind of paying attention to it over the last few days as I've been working on it. And for every minute of the video that I'm producing, it's taking me maybe an hour of time, something in that region. By the time I record it, do the, you know, move the video into my computer, get it imported, and the import process takes a long time into Final Cut Pro, and then do the editing, and then I go back to record a bit more. So it's just taking so long, but it's getting there. I'm at the point now of, um, showing configuration of uh, Grafana and that is uh, that's actually a kind of tricky thing to show. I find the Grafana user interface to be not intuitive at all and <clears throat> so it's taking a little while but that's basically the last thing that I have to do for this video is showing how to uh, pull the data out of InfluxDB and display it in Grafana so you've got nice little charts of air quality or temperature or whatever it is the data is that you've been recording. So the video is very close and if I, um, if I spend the rest of the day working on it, once again, it is conceivably possible that I could get that last few minutes worth filmed today and edited and begin the upload. So ah, I just want to get that one out of the way <laughs> so I can get on to more fun things. Um, Alrighty, uh, um, oh yes, so that's the reminder, <laughs> so thanks Sion for pointing that out, make a cast this weekend, yes, and um, Blitz City DIY is the host this year, uh, this time, so go and check out make a cast, Sion has already dropped the link in the video chat there, so uh, yes. Check it out. 
Oh yeah, so Stephen Hawes, yeah, he's. I don't think he's on this month. He was on last time, I think, or he was on one of the recent ones anyway, uh, talking about his pick and place project. So, uh, I think I'd better wrap it up there. I'm sure there's more I could talk about. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes, Sion, you are very welcome to take over my channel. <laughs> um <clears throat> and thank you for all your advice. Uh, yes, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming along on this. I was going to say sunny Sunday, but it's been it started as a rainy Sunday, and then it became a windy Sunday. Now it's just an overcast Sunday. At least that's what my uh, monitor up over the top tells me. I can't see directly, but I can see what the camera tells me <laughs> the day is like, and I'll go out and experience it personally now when I grab some lunch and then hopefully continue with this video. So thank you very much everyone for coming along. As usual, I've got to try to remember how to end this stream. I think I click this big end button that is in front of me right now. So um, uh, yeah, have a great week and I will talk to you really soon. See ya.